final area in which I'd like to highlight the value of neuraxial blockade is orthopedic surgery. Total hip and knee arthroplasty is extremely common worldwide given our aging population and prolonged lifespan. These surgeries can easily be done under spinal anesthesia. But whether or not you receive a spinal or general anesthetic may depend more often than not on the country, the hospital's culture and preferences and those of your anesthesiologist. Particularly in the US, it appears that general anesthesia is much more common. This is unfortunate, as it is now quite clear from multiple large retrospective reviews and from randomized control trials that neuraxial blockade is associated with improved patient-centered outcomes. This 2019 article presents consensus recommendations from a large international group of experts and is an excellent summary of the current evidence available. In this table, I've summarized the main findings. Points of particular note include the fact that spinal anesthesia reduced mortality risk in total hip arthroplasty. There was no significant difference in mortality in total knee replacements, but the rate of many of the same major complications was lower. And you will see that most of the major organ systems are represented. The only downside to spinal anesthesia was an increased rate of urinary retention. What's equally important to note is that there were no outcomes for which general anesthesia was superior. To be fair, total joint replacement is pretty safe as you can see from the estimated incidences, which makes the absolute risk reduction relatively small. But nevertheless, given the volumes of joint replacement surgeries done worldwide, spinal anesthesia offers clear benefit with very little downside. According to one estimate in the US alone, we are looking at a million total hips and 4 million total knees by the year 2030. The mechanisms for these benefits are not entirely understood, but the major factors probably include avoiding the alterations in lung function that occur with positive pressure ventilation and increased organ perfusion from vasodilatation. Related to that, although we often associate spinal anesthesia with hypotension, in reality, it has actually been found to occur less commonly probably because we are very vigilant for it and because it is easily treated with vasopressor drugs. So in all in all, there's a good case for spinal anesthesia being the routine approach and perhaps even standard of care in modern joint replacement surgery, especially hip replacements. What about hip fracture surgery? This is also a very common cause of significant morbidity or mortality worldwide. Can spinal anesthesia improve outcomes in the same way that it does for hip replacements? This question is one which has been and continues to be intensely studied. And some of the best data and research on the subject has come out of the UK, which is also generally speaking more pro neuraxial block than the United States. Nevertheless, in this audit of surgical cases performed in England and Wales in 2012, we see that general anesthesia was actually a relatively common choice. It turns out that when we look at almost all studies to date, including systematic reviews and large observational studies, we have not found any significant difference in mortality associated with the use of spinal or general anesthesia. The one exception was in Korea, which reported a statistically significant but clinically marginal reduction in mortality with regional rather than general anesthesia. As with the total hip replacements, spinal anesthesia may be associated with a lower risk of blood transfusion and urinary tract infection, as it was demonstrated in a propensity match database analysis from Nottingham in the UK over the period 2004 to 2015. But just to illustrate the problems with retrospective studies in establishing causality, note that the rate of chest infections in this study was higher in the spinal anesthesia group. You might ask how this can be. Well, it turns out that there were twice as many patients with COPD in the spinal anesthesia group. This isn't that surprising as most of us would view that as an indication for attempting spinal anesthesia. But these patients may be at higher risk of chest infections regardless of whether they are intubated or not, purely by virtue of their disease. Now, bearing in mind what I just said about not confusing association with causality, it's still worth noting that a subgroup analysis of the patients in this Nottingham cohort with cardiovascular disease showed that there was a statistically significant decrease in 30-day mortality associated with spinal anesthesia 
Some of us also favor spinal anesthesia in hip fracture patients, believing that avoiding general anesthesia may reduce the risk of postoperative delirium. The same Korean study observed a statistically significant difference, but again, this wasn't as large as we might have hoped for. One explanation could be the sedation that is often combined with spinal anesthesia, which can, if we're not careful, be as deep as a general anesthetic. I've discussed the finding of Fry trial on depth of sedation earlier, and you will remember that although there was no overall difference in the instance of delirium, the healthier patients did benefit from a lighter level of sedation. So I think that less is definitely more in this case. To sum up, hip fracture patients are medically complex, and it's likely that many factors, apart from the type of anesthesia, contribute to the outcome. As the old song says, maybe it ain't what you do, but the way that you do it. Avoiding a delay in surgery is one of the critical factors, and we as anesthesiologists should play our part by not insisting on excessive workup and investigations. What about the patient, though, who is on anticoagulant therapy, which is an increasingly common scenario? In my institution, at least, surgeons are willing to operate earlier than most of us would be prepared to do a spinal anesthetic, at least according to ASRA and ESRA guidelines. What is very interesting is that this issue has been recognized by the Association of Anesthetists in Great Britain. And in their 2020 guidelines on hip fracture management, they have recently recommended a more pragmatic and aggressive approach if spinal anesthesia is truly indicated. They suggest that antiplatelet therapy is not an absolute contraindication, and that spinal anesthesia can also be considered in patients on direct oral anticoagulants who have normal renal function once only two half-lives have elapsed, rather than the four to five half-lives that is usually recommended. This is based on the fact that the risk of hematoma with spinal anesthesia is very low, much lower than with epidurals. Now, I recognize that this is certainly not a recommendation that everyone will be comfortable with, so I would advise that you consider your local practice environment before deciding whether to incorporate it into your practice. Regardless of whether you perform general or spinal anesthesia though, it is a good idea to avoid intraoperative hypotension. The lowest recorded systolic and mean blood pressure has been shown to correlate with both 5-day and 30-day mortality. And this is thought to be a marker of organ hypoperfusion. So where does that leave us? My personal opinion, recognizing that I am an enthusiast of regional anesthesia, is that spinal anesthesia is an appropriate first-line option if it is feasible and does not in itself delay proceeding to surgery. There is an overriding theme in this talk, which is that neuroaxial blockade offers lots of potential benefit with very little downside. And certainly the surgical similarities make it reasonable to expect to see some of the advantages observed with spinal anesthesia in total hip arthroplasty in the hip fracture repair surgery as well. The benefits are likely to be maximized by attention to simple things like maintaining normal tension and using minimal sedation. If you do decide to incorporate spinal anesthesia more into your practice, the issue that you may find is making your spinal anesthetic work, particularly in the older patient who will have degenerative disease and deformity of the spine. There are two main categories of neuraxial block failure. One is technical failure and the other is therapeutic failure. Therapeutic failure is an easier one to address. It's largely due to the dose of local anesthetic that you administer and the factors that govern distribution of local anesthetic within the CSF. The most important of these are the bericity of the local anesthetic solution and the positioning of the patient. With, with regard to technical difficulty, there are only a few reasons for this in my opinion. These are listed here, but the good news is that there are ways to address all of them. There are three things I believe are critical. One is good fundamental and needle handling technique, which I have sought to describe in two videos on my YouTube channel. And the second is detailed knowledge of the anatomy of the spine. If you do contact bone or needle insertion, you should have a rough guess as to what that bone is, what part of the vertebra you're touching. Is it spinous process, lamina, or facet joint? And that will allow you to make a logical and reasoned redirection that will eventually take you into the space. What you want is to have a three-dimensional mental model of the spine in your head. The third thing is to acquire the ability to do ultrasound imaging of the spine. 
to visualize the under, underlying anatomy and to locate the interlaminar spaces more precisely. I could happily spend another couple of hours taking you through this, but we only have the time to just give you an idea of what this involves. I encourage you to refer to my other YouTube videos that cover spine ultrasound imaging in detail that range from the basics to how to employ them in more challenging patients, and then to invest in practicing this skill in your day-to-day -day work. This brief video illustrates this process in its entirety. The transverse view is used to obtain a view of the anterior complex and the posterior complex, signifying that the interlaminar space is being imaged. With this view, we center the neuraxial midline on the screen, clean all the gel, and make a marking in dry skin. This ensures that the markings will stay in place even when the skin is prepped with the antiseptic solution. As can be seen here, if the markings have been made on clean dry skin, they will still be visible even after preparation. Provided a good image has been obtained and that the markings have been made accurately, first pass, first pass success is usually the case. It's probably clear to most of you, however, that that patient did not need ultrasound to have a successful spinal. The conventional landmark guide, guided technique would have worked just as well. The real role of ultrasound imaging is as an advanced skill to be used when faced with challenging patients. And just as with all advanced skills, however, we need to practice it on easy patients before we actually have to use it in the difficult one. And if you do that, Ultrasound imaging will transform the distribution of the difficulty of uniraxial blocks from this into this. This video was taken as part of a study into the utility of ultrasound imaging in patients with difficult surface landmarks. Here the operator, who is a novice anesthesiologist, is attempting to do a spinal anesthesia in patient who has poorly palpable spinous processes. The needle is inserted in the approximate midline, but clearly they're struggling to find the interlaminar space. Repeated bony contact is being made. However, this is a good illustration of why suboptimal fundamental technique also plays a part in difficulty. The redirections are fairly haphazard and non-systematic and thus are ultimately unhelpful. In addition, it is not clear if this standard 90 millimeter needle was long enough to actually reach the interlaminar space in this patient. And so it is not until the fifth attempt that a switch to a longer 120 millimeter needle was employed. Note again, the sort of random left to right redirections of the needle based on not anything more than just guesswork as to where the space might be. Ultimately, the study criteria for a rescue ultrasound were met, and this was employed. The probe was draped with a sterile probe cover. A transverse view of the interlamin space was obtained. The midline was identified together with the anterior and posterior complexes, signifying the location of the interlamin space. I am always meticulous in trying to obtain the best possible view of the space and making sure that the marks I make are as accurate as possible on the skin relative to the actual bone underneath. Even with the marks, I still pay attention to the fundamental techniques. I seek the interspinal space with resistance to injection, and I fix the skin whenever moving needles in and out 
so that the skin puncture point overlies exactly where I intend to go relative to the bony spine. I use tactile feedback from the needle. In this case, I've contacted bone at a fairly shallow depth, signifying a spinous process that I then need to walk off with a very slight cephalad angulation. I also hold the long, flexible 25 gauge 120mm needle along its shaft to prevent bending and to ensure it travels in a straight line. There are therefore three main indications for which I use ultrasound imaging nowadays. First, if I really need to know where I'm going, or if I want to give a patient the first class treatment. Second, if I think I'm going to have some trouble. Or third, as I've just shown you, to get myself out of trouble that I failed to anticipate. This video, which I recently uploaded to my YouTube channel, is another good example of how to use ultrasound for anticipated difficulty, and I encourage you to check it out. The choice of whether to perform neuraxial blockade in your patient is ultimately a balance of benefit versus risk, as it is for anything that we do. There are clear benefits that have been demonstrated for major patient-centered outcomes in a variety of settings. And while the strength and quality of evidence does vary, it's interesting to note that there are almost never any outcomes for which general anesthesia has been shown to be better than neuraxial blockade. The main obstacle to neuraxial blockade, in my opinion, is the, our perception of the complications associated with it and our perception of the difficulty that may be a involved in performing it. Technical difficulty can, however, be addressed with ultrasound imaging, and the data indicates that neuraxial blockade is a lot safer than we think it is. I therefore leave you with this thought from a letter to the editor written by some distinguished names in the field of anesthesia that also suggests the balance is very much in favour of neuraxial blockade. Ultimately, though, the decision must be individualised based on your patient, your own skill set, and the circumstances that you find yourself in.